Communicating science effectively is no easy thing, as evidence look no further than the public discourse surrounding vaccines. But when done right, it inspires all of us to learn more about ourselves, to explore, and to accomplish things that just decades ago would have been considered impossible. How we talk about scientific discovery and advancement will decide how much or how little the public gets to participate in it, and whether or not they see themselves benefiting from it at all. Thankfully, there are people out there like author Paul Zer, who sat down with me to offer his insights on science communication, being inspired in his own research by those recovering from neurotrauma, Olympic doping, and human potential. Welcome to SBME Interfaces. Today, it is my very good honor to interface with E. Paul Zare. He is a professor of neuroscience and kinesiology at the University of Victoria, whose research focuses on post-neurotrauma recovery. He is an award-winning and passionate science communicator, which is one of the reasons why I'm really excited to talk to you. Uh, he is a comic book enthusiast, martial artist, lifelong student of the wonder of the human body. He's the author of four books and multiple articles exploring what we're learning and developing on the frontiers of human capability. And how far should we take that? Uh, all through the lens of superheroes. Uh, he's a regular speaker at San Diego and New York Comic Con and WonderCon. He has a popular neuroscience blog called Black Belt Brain at Psychology Today. And I am very, very happy to welcome him to the show. Uh, well, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to speak with you. Absolutely. My um, the, One of the places I really want to start is uh, in researching you. I found this uh, article you wrote back in, I think, 2012, talking about um, you were you were looking at your papers and you saw one, I think, with 150 citations and you had this question for yourself about acceptable impact. Was that an acceptable impact um, on humanity with your research and that sort of thing. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that idea of acceptable impact and um, how you feel you're making an impact in the world right now. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I would say um, it's a personal thing, you know, what, what your sort of fit in society and what you think your impact is. Uh, for me, you know, back in about the mid 2000s is where I sort of, uh, I wrote about it later, but that's where I was sort of really sort of questioning, I guess, sort of what, what role do I actually have in society? You know, like what, you know, I did a lot of things, you know, I was teaching martial arts, I was involved in all kinds of, you know, extracurricular stuff. I was a professor and, a, you know, doing all professor type stuff and doing all kinds of things. But I was really just wondering about, was I doing the the kind of things that align with how I saw myself as a person in society like this was some real deep uh, navel gazing sort of uh, <laughs> stuff and um and, and what I for me I sort of came up with the answer that no I, I wasn't really aligned with where I thought I would be going with my career at that point and what I mean by that is I kind of got into science by accident um you know I got into science because of martial arts and martial arts because of comic books um, but I was really inspired when I went off to university by my sister who had gone to medical school. And I, I was really interested in uh, going into medicine like uh, she did. Um, I didn't want to become an obstetrician. I was more thinking the neurology or internal medicine or something like that. But, but anyway, the point was I, I wanted to help people. That, that's why I was interested in going into medicine. That's why I was doing the stuff I was doing. When I got into university, I got involved in all kinds of research projects and realized, as we discuss in our family, uh, my sister is the medical doctor. I was going to be the science doctor. Um, but it was because I wanted to help people. And I crafted a whole research program around, you know, rehabilitative stuff and trying to understand mechanisms and designing interventions and helping people. Um, but but I, a lot of the kind of helping I was doing was pretty indirect. Right, like you help people by publishing something and by talking to people, and you know, in scientific talks, but it takes a while for the impact and the filter down to actually affect people's daily lives to come out of that. I mean, it does, and and there's lots of good things for that, and I'm happy with what I've done in my career from that part of things, but I wasn't happy enough about how it was impacting society, and I really thought about I need to be more direct. I, I want to do more stuff where I'm directly trying to communicate stuff to people who normally would not get, you know, deep knowledge about neuroscience or kinesiology or a brain machine interface or genetic engineering or whatever the heck the topic was. And that really made me start to think about getting more serious and focused and really 
taking some steps that eventually led, you know, to doing some of the popular science writing I've done and blogs and so on, but really the, the books that I had written, it, it started with that sort of thinking, um, you know, instead of imagining citations and, you know, in a pure academic sort of abstract sense as a, a marker of impact, more engagement, you know, with people directly and readers and, uh, you know, where it starts to be uh, good reads and reviews and stuff on Amazon and, uh, you know, page views <laughs> become your other metrics if you need them, but it's a different kind of thing. And for me, that uh, allowed me to sort of come closer to what I thought was at my core being, which was really somebody who's trying to help people. And the way I could do that was by reshaping knowledge so that it was in a different package for folks that normally wouldn't be able to access that. I, that's it, it's one of the most important things for me it, um, is that that repackaging and that sort of clearing the throat of science so that it can be better understood in the last two years um, like do you, has there been any insights for you in the way science has been you know presented to the public and that sort of thing in ways that we can do better ways that you, you know, any insights for you at all really in that space yeah I mean it's been interesting right to think about the whole uh, public health stuff and science communication around vaccines and disease progression and infectious, infectious diseases and all kinds of things. And, you know, I don't want to blame people for anything, but, but I think a lot of, I, I think, and again, it's all retrospective, right? It's hindsight. But, but I think we could have done better um, with a little bit more effective communication up front. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what I mean by that is, for example, uh, and I did write a thing like this on my Psychology Today blog because it bothered me. So I wrote a thing about, you know, how part of the problem was a failure of science communication. What I mean by that is one of the big things we had and still have is, a, you know, vaccine hesitancy and, you know, worries about it and all kinds of reasons. There, there, there's all kinds of stuff wrapped up in there. But part of it is there's still a part of it that's kind of a disbelief that the thing actually works and that mm. the vaccine is safe. Now, if you wind back a couple of years, when folks were talking about, okay, this thing is happening, you know, we're no longer in a management phase of the pandemic, it's a full-blown pandemic and we're gonna need vaccines. Oh, but the messaging was, it takes years to develop a vaccine. It's gotta go through so many clinical, it's gonna it takes forever. It'll be a miracle if we had something in five years, right? So somebody who doesn't know is sitting there listening to that message and going, wow, that's impossible for us to have a vaccine. Boom, all of a sudden, 18 months later, here's a vaccine. And, you know, even if you didn't, you know, if you're trying to be charitable, you'd be going, um, didn't you guys tell us that it was pretty much impossible to have this thing? And now you're giving it to us now? Why would you expect people to get on board right away and, and be, oh yeah, that makes sense. Without, so where I'm going with this, what's the take home? This is just me complaining a bit. What's the take home? This is good, yeah. The take home is, is, is a thing that I think is a huge issue in science communication. That is people trying to be 100% accurate. Mm. They won't wanna give an answer that that's 100% correct. Like a scientific paper, which even, there's no such thing as 100% correct, obviously. Yeah. But um, you know, a, a scientific paper has got all kinds of stuff and it's valid and your limitations and this and that and the next thing. I think in science communication and, and biomedical communication and medical education, it needs to be for, for getting the general message, I think it should be like what I call the 80% solution. The answer needs to be 80% correct, mostly correct. Don't get bogged down in the details. That can come later, or if people want to drill into it, they can do so. But get the general thing out there <clears throat> and say something like, yeah, normally it takes this, but you know what? We might be able to get this done in a year if this happens. We might be able to, do, but instead it was about the doomsday scenario, and it's going to be this, and it's going to be that, and we'll never get there. Well, uh, obviously we did get there, but we have a lot of people who, from the perspective of, you know, the kind of argument I'm making, rightfully are kind of going, how did that work? You told me it would take five years and now you, it took, you know, 12 months. Um, and, and I think that where I'm going with this is that if you already have people who don't understand science very well, and you tell them stuff that seems very certain, and then your certainty actually is around uncertainty, and then it changes again later, I mean, how can people get on board with it? And, and I don't know, 
this wouldn't in any way have solved, uh, you know, there's all kinds of other stuff that's wrapped into the vaccine stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, but a part of it is still this, I think, that this certainly didn't help. And there's a portion of those people who I think are the vaccine deniers or whatever you want to call them, anti-vaxxers, I guess, but I don't like that term that much, mm -hmm. um, that those folks might have been more accepting of believing what scientists, uh, you know, and epidemiologists and infectious disease experts were saying when we were getting to a place where, yeah, there is this vaccine. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of them, actually, and uh, we're going to try them out and they seem to work. And, and, and I think that we did ourselves a disservice. Like it, it's kind of like um, a metaphor I've used in talking about that same idea is, you know, the classic example of somebody who has, you know, unfortunate, you know, spinal cord injury, and then their neurosurgeon tells them, like we see in the movies all the time, you'll never walk again. And, you know, the person, the neurosurgeon is trying to make sure that person is prepared for the worst case scenario right? They want them to understand there is a chance you will never walk again, which is true. Just like there was a chance we'd never be able to develop a vaccine in time to be useful in this pandemic. However, at the other end, this is possible. It's possible with aggressive physical rehabilitation and, you know, all these things and a bunch of other factors we can't control that you might be able to recover some stepping, you might be able to do this, you might be able to do that. You know, it's possible depending upon how quickly things go and how much funding and how many labs and how many companies and how many countries get involved, we might be able to get a vaccine within 12 months or whatever it would be. But instead, it was always fixed on the other end, which was the doomsday mm -hmm. part. Like the, and, and partly, I think that's, you know, human nature. But I think that that's why it's so important to kind of get the general idea out there, make sure it's open ended, but just get general principles across, especially at the beginning of the messaging. Because that's when it's critical. Instead of, oh my God, it's a, we're never going to have this. It's like, okay, this is going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. But this could happen if we do this. Like, uh, in a way, it, it's sort of like just being more respectful that people can follow you a little bit, you know, without the details, but just the ideas. And, and, and I, I really think, I think that doesn't happen enough to be honest. Yeah. That's really well said. You just, you just uh, highlighted something to me I hadn't thought about before, which is because we got that first part wrong, we also can't tell the story of how extraordinary it is that we, we threw all of our resources and all of our focus at this thing and we were able to kick out an extraordinary technology based on something that was already 12, 15 years old, right? But we were yeah. able to do that. That's a compelling story, but we can't tell that story yep. now. Right. That's no, it, it, yeah. it's like a, a moon landing kind of idea. Right. We're going to, you know, in the U.S. that we're going to land on the moon. I mean, it was kind of it's kind of like that from an infectious disease perspective. And <laughs> it's impossible to tell it like that now because it's all been just wrapped up in all kinds of other stuff, which is a, which is really unfortunate because not just for the, the lack of uptake on vaccines for, in some quarters or at least the, the, you know, the resistance and all the different movements that really complicated people's lives unnecessarily. Like it's not doing anything useful. It's just you know, people doing something for the sake of doing something. But it's also you know, the, the folks who worked really hard um, you know, to come up with these vaccines. Like that was an extraordinary effort and it involved a, a really you know, extraordinary amount of collaboration and cooperation across all kinds, all sectors. And it's a great story, but it's buried under all this other stuff. Like it's just, mm. it's in, it's in kind of the wreckage underneath a whole bunch of other things. And um, that's really sad. Like it's really unfortunate. And as I said, I'm, I'm not trying to say that, uh, you know, had we had people communicating more effectively that somehow that would have been salvaged. Um, but, but I, I think, I think it could have helped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Has this, um, like, because of all this, has it changed anything about the way you want to communicate now when you, when you communicate science or even, um, uh, like you're, you're a teacher, you're an educator really, um, at the, at the heart of everything, right? Do you, do you think that's changed your perspective on educating people? Well, I, I'm not sure because a lot of what I've just talked about, you know, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or anything, but a lot of what I've tried to talk about here was already embedded in, in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, so for example, my first book, uh, Becoming Batman, The Possibility of a Superhero. Like I give the range of things. I say that it's pretty impossible for you to actually become Batman, but there's other stuff in between there that are real things you can do. So like trying to benchmark the range of stuff. Yeah, forget about way out here and who wants to be out there anyway, in reality. Like here's the reality, what that looks like. Do you really want that? Um, 
But these other things exist, right? And these are things you can reasonably get to um, rather than just saying this doesn't exist so the whole thing is useless. Um, and, and I think that uh, when, when I, when I've been thinking through some of the stuff we've been talking about, you know, over the last couple of years, it really just solidified um, to, you know, for me, re help me reframe some stuff and think about what I was already doing, maybe in a little different way. And, and, and maybe making sure that, you know, when I'm, because I do get called on and people do ask me about science communication just in general at different times from the stuff I've done, um, you know, just make sure I get that message across. The key thing, it, it used to be part of my message was, when I would talk to people, you, you can't, this isn't a statistically reasoned, you know, probability driven thing when you're trying to get general ideas and what the P level is and, the, you know, whatever. Um, but really hitting on really being clear, don't do that. Do this, please just forget about that. They can dig into that, get to the main point. What is the main point and is it mostly correct? Mm -hmm. Because if you get stumbling around about the 100% correct or whatever, whatever it is with the probability and then all the different kind of boundaries, you, you never get to a place where you can give that nuanced message about here's the range of what we might expect. And we can't say for sure, but if this happens, this might happen, you know, and, and I think when you tell people messages like that, I don't think they need to have either or stop. I think it's mm -hmm. easier for politicians to talk about, right, to yeah. say yeah. It's this or it's that. Whereas I think you can still get a message out there that reasonable people will, you know, go along with and go, okay, all right, these people are saying this could happen if that happens. And so I think what it really did for me was uh, try to make me think more clearly about mm -hmm. my own experiences and how I could maybe reshape messaging there that, that might help get across some of the ideas I, that I thought were important. Mm -hmm. that, that speaks to uh, like an underlying thread of all your work and uh, and you, you've spoken about this too like on, on a TEDx stage as well is uh, this idea of understanding the human body and what that did for you right and finding that clarity in that space so like the, uh, of the human body when you think about the the people who may not have access to that understanding or that science and you're trying to give them that access what are those light bulbs you want to turn on like what uh, what do you hope people get out of understanding more about their body yeah, I think I really hope they get more just an understanding of life, mm. right? That, that um, you know, I don't want to get all Zen, although it's not, no. not bad to get all Zen with a bunch of stuff. But I mean, to get into the idea of just being alive and what it means to be a living creature and how we're humans, but we're related to all these other, all the whole animal kingdom and all our existence is really about moving and having sensory experiences, all these kinds of things. And that if people can understand more about how they work, they can appreciate also how other animals work or vice versa. If we're, if we're talking about their pet cat or dog, that can also inform about how they walk around with the nuances about being a biped versus you know, a quadrupedal animal or something. So I think for me, I, I try to think really big picture, like what is the bigger thing I'm trying to hit on here? And then the different messaging is around what are the little pieces that might be things that would inform this? Cause you're never gonna be able to get across everything, right? You, you, mm -hmm. I, trying to think about, you know, giving talks or talking with, with people, getting across like three ideas, right? That, that's, I right. think should be your objective, something like that. Just some three things that they can remember, people can take home, people can think about. And so for me, I think it really does come down to just getting people to appreciate just the whole idea of, the, of, of just how amazing, you know, animal life actually is and, and about how it's built on simple, simple things like stress and adaptation. Everything is about some kind of stress and some kind of tissue level, molecularly supported mechanistic adaptation to something. And and I think it's amazing when you start to think about that and think about evolution and how things are all connected. And I, I think if we can get people thinking like that, and I believe this is sort of part of what's made me feel that's an important message, is it just it embeds us in a bigger picture, right? So that we can have some, some focus on who we are as a species or who we are as individual people, but also realize we're part of a whole big planet, right? With all kinds of biospheres uh, interacting. And, and I, I just think that when people don't think about any of those things, I think it's harder to get to that connectome idea of everything being connected. Mm -hmm. um, because how can you make connections between stuff that you don't understand what the stuff was that's supposed to be connected, right? So yeah. um, that's may seem a bit sort of uh, 
wildly philosophical, but that's generally how I think about stuff. Yeah. No, not at all. I actually agree wholeheartedly, right? Like that's, I think that's the key light bulb to turn on everybody, right? Is we're, we're all made of the same yeah. stuff. <laughs> and, and yes. And, and I think that one of the things that, it, that resonate with me with that kind of approach is the idea that, um, you know, when you think about the impact and, 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 and a kind of a, a distance between impact between publishing a paper and then you know where it shows up or who reads it or whatever versus doing a talk with a group of high school students or at, at a public whatever right comic con with a thousand people who are there or whatever the group is or writing a book or whatever the thing <clears throat> where you've got the direct messaging it you can get closer to that whole idea that i, I really think that even though you know, the way society is organized uh, now and with everything, even the kind of interview we're doing right now where it's remote and all that kind of stuff. I think it comes down to individual interactions with people, right? Mm -hmm. That is the key part. That is the key thing that that's how we have evolved is, uh, you know, as, a, as animals and, you know, living in communities and smaller ones initially, and then eventually into villages and towns and cities and then technology and all this stuff. It still all comes down to like interpersonal interactions and communicating with actual individual people. And I think that when you, when you, if you can sort of put some of these things together like that with whatever you're doing, we're just talking, you know, science communication right now, but whatever it is, mm -hmm. I think you're hitting on those authentic things that can have meaningful impacts on people. And I, I'm a big believer of the whole idea of the thin edge of the wedge, you know, get some stuff in there. And the idea that we advance things by just slow, steady pressure. You just keep pushing on something slow and steady. It takes a lot of perseverance and it's a long time scale. But I think that's how you make meaningful kind of inroads into something. And so it just requires, you know, going back again. And here's another way. And here's a different kind of thing. And on and on and on. So it requires a lot of patience. But again, it comes down to this interpersonal thing. It's funny on the the on that sort of note too the the what I would call the patience of science right this this long term way that we can find more truth or at least more accurate truth um, I I was gonna ask you is there anything really exciting say that's come out in the last like the, you know the last two decades have been called like the two decades of the brain right where we've we've made so much inroads in neuroscience and. Um, and I'm really, 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 really interested in this space. Is there anything that's really exciting to you that has come out on like the, the bleeding edge of that science lately? Well, I think one of, I think one of the most important things that I think is now starting to permeate a lot of, you know, the actual scientific work, but also the, how it's getting messaged towards, you know, people, regardless of, you know, whether they're, other scientists who aren't, uh, you know, trained in neuroscience or the general public or whoever. I think one of the most important things that's emerged, and, and it's not like this wasn't known already, but the way it's being shaped, is the idea that of all the bodily systems we could um, think of, uh, there's an irony, we're talking about neuroscience and thinking about stuff, but um, of all the systems we could, we could uh, talk about, the nervous system is the one that's the most poorly predicted by just straight up morphology and anatomy. So for example, if, if you took the heart out of an animal, a human, whatever kind of heart, and you just gave it to somebody and asked them to play with it for a while and figure out what it did, you know, and you gave them some fluid, some water or something, you know, they'd be able to figure out that there's a thing and it kind of pumps some stuff and you push on this and then stuff squirts out over here. Like mm -hmm. you'd be able to figure out at least a little bit of what the function of that thing is. Whereas the nervous system, it's the connection between nervous system, neural activity within the brain, the spinal cord, all the different connections between synapses, you know, 10,000 possibly or a thousand to 10,000 on each neuron times a hundred billion neurons, like, you know, trillions of synaptic connections. It's the relative change in activation of all those connections that actually give rise to the rich behavior that we see and that you and I are experiencing right now when we talk. It's not just simple, let's look at uh, you know, a CT scan of somebody's brain and spinal cord and be able to predict a whole bunch of stuff. Although that is super useful for some things, you know, for gross morphological changes and disease states or somebody's had a, an accident or that kind of thing. It, it's more about the relative physiological activation of all these circuits that give rise to all these things. And that's, it's very difficult 
um, to image or very difficult to get simultaneous recordings from all kinds of places with different kinds of analyses. And that's where I'm kind of going with this is that we've got more and more technologies that are allowing us to do more simultaneous recordings of kind of anatomy and blood flow and EEG signatures and you know some fMRI, like all these different things that if we can get them all at the same time will allow us to get closer to this idea of capturing what it means to be thinking about something or what it means to be you know, behaving in a certain way. And I think that's important to, to help people get to a better understanding of the nervous system, that it isn't just, you know, back, uh, you, you just cut the thing open and look at a cross section of the brain, you see some gaps where some fluid goes and you see some other stuff and there's some gray, you know, different colored things. And, you know, there it's the richness of the connections and we don't have, you know, none of our other systems are really like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that has been a real challenge um, for folks to get at the function within the nervous system, for people to try and understand it as well, right? Um, you know, it, regardless of who they are, um, you know, when I used to teach uh, in the medical program or when I was teaching neuroscience or can you say, everybody has a certain, it's like math anxiety gets turned into nervous system anxiety. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just seems like it's so complicated or the best example of a take home I've ever had was a second year medical student who we were talking about something in one of the tutorials and just said, man, brains are weird, um, <laughs> which for me totally captured the idea, right? It is this thing that changes and, you know, that's the point. Mm -hmm. If it didn't do that, you wouldn't be able to even be sitting here to try and study how it works because you need that flexibility and that dynamic kind of reallocation of connections to even do what you're doing. Um, and I think that that, you know, this connectome idea and this idea of things moving towards uh, a deeper understanding that's not just let's image a bunch of stuff. Let's mm -hmm. talk about how it works. And, and I think that that's where uh, lots of aspects of the field have moved towards it. To me, that's not something that I did as part of my active research program, but mm -hmm. um, something I, I I find really fascinating. Yeah, I, I've uh, I'm I'm briefly acquainted with the work of uh, V. S. Ramachandran, and uh, and like that was one of those situations where even knowing like understanding a little bit more about the brain made it even weirder to me. Where I was like, that's amazing yeah. that that plasticity can do this, right? Or or whatever. It's fascinating work. Um, yeah. So one of the things we we talked about briefly before we started is. Recently, you, um, well, not so recently, I guess a few years back, you had a concussion from a car accident. And um, it's, as we, we talked about, your area of research is, you know, post neurotrauma recovery and that sort of thing has, first of all, um, I know you were faced with potentially having to leave authorship behind, which must have been a very difficult thing. Mm -hmm. So how are you on that in that space? But also has your research and work actually been able to come to your rescue on that front? Is it something that has been helpful? Yeah, yes and no, I would say. <laughs> it, it's a quick answer to all the things you just asked. I, I mean, I think um, it, it's, it's a bit of a challenge even though I try to think of it more, my mom always used to say, you know, we take things from our parents sometimes, right? And mm -hmm. she was always this person who was like, if life hands you lemons, you just gotta make lemonade, like this kind of thing, right? <laughs> and and she was always very optimistic, but the truth is, that is, I mean, that is true. Like, if you're gonna do something, you gotta make something or whatever you got. Mm -hmm. And it, it's ironic, yes, to be a neuroscientist with a brain injury, you know, that is, yeah. uh, that's, that's an irony. And, um, you can either sort of uh, feel sad about it, which of course you do, but but what are you going to do now, right? Like, mm -hmm. so a lot of my process since, you know, that last car accident, um, which was just one concussion too many in my life, mm -hmm. and um, it has been trying to figure out what can I still do, and what kind of contributions can I still make to circle back to the core thing of who I think I'm trying to be in the world, like somebody who's trying to help people, like what, what can I still do out of all that? And then how, how, how do I need to reshape things? And then that itself takes a while. Mm -hmm. And in terms of how my own kind of background and research have, have helped with that, I would say that um, the work itself, not directly, except from the idea of understanding, you know, the concept of plasticity and that things are gonna take a while and there's different kinds of plasticity and there's, you know, 
mechanistic level, then is your behavioral plasticity, but what you choose to do once you know a little bit more what's going on, those kinds of things. But one of the direct things that actually has um, been helpful to me is that over the years of doing lots of intervention studies, many of which were in stroke, a lot of the projects we were doing were in post-stroke rehab and trying different kinds of interventions for, you know, help people get stronger or improve their balance or walking ability, you know, functional kind of tasks. I mean, what I saw with those folks, of course, they're, they're the ones who sign up for your studies. So they're already kind of um, self-selecting themselves to be, you know, they want to do something. But they were always working so hard and trying to be positive and doing something, you know, mm -hmm. it's a research project. We can't say this is going to help you, but they wanted to try anyways because they figured they could help somebody else even if they couldn't help themselves or they would be doing all these kinds of things, you know, just with their effort, just come into the lab three times a week or whatever the intervention was. And, and I think about those folks and, and think about, you know, that's kind of inspiring too when you're struggling with things and, you know, not the same kinds of things necessarily, but that, you know, having, you know, kind of to circle back to Batman, actually, um, one of my favorite quotes, and I use it in my, one of, in my books and talks all the time, is from Batman Begins. And it's this quote where we've got uh, Henri Descartes with uh, Bruce Wayne, you know, um, so it's the Liam Neeson scene when they're on a glacier. And he's talking about training. He says that training is nothing without the will to act. Mm -hmm. You have to have the will to do something. And, you know, that's what I saw in those folks who were helping us. And that's what I have to remind myself about, you know, in my own situation when I'm trying to find a, a way is to have the will to do it. And that's the key, right? At the end of the day, no matter what it is, any kind of plasticity, any kind of anything, it's driven by trying to do something. And, and I think that that has helped me a little bit, you know, trying to draw from those things and realizing that it's, it's just very important to do those things and uh, it for, your, for yourself, but also for others even. I mean, one of the things I'll never forget was a comment from a, a research a participant of ours who was a, post, a guy post-stroke, about his stroke was maybe 15 years before and he was involved in more studies. A lot of our studies were in chronic stroke at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, what we used to do is every couple of years, we'd invite everybody back to, to the lab who'd been involved in studies and we'd have kind of like a little tea or whatever. And I'd give a little talk about what we've discovered from the studies they were involved with. You know, here's what we found. Remember when you came into this? Well, here's what, it, here's what we published, but here's, you know, I didn't just show them slides of like data or something, but <laughs> you know, I, I did say, here's this, but here's, here's the meaning of it. This is what we found. And I remember this one guy um, uh, put his hand up and he said, look, that's great. But I think it's really important for you to understand that just the fact that you're actually doing this research actually helps us in our daily stuff that we're trying to do. The fact that somebody is trying to do things and is trying to study and is trying to apply and putting these things together is super inspirational to me. And I still think about that, you know, that um, no matter what kind of things, you know, some of the stuff that I'm dealing with when I'm trying to find a way forward, you know, uh, in the place where I'm at right now, you know, maybe there's a way to tell a story about that at some point, which helps other people, um, you know, that circles back to how do we be authentic and stay true to whatever our mission in life is, whatever that is for each person. And, and I think that, uh, uh, of course, if you can bring your experiences to bear on that, which I've, which I've tried to do um, uh, as best I can, just like you expect anybody, right? Just, uh, just have that will to act and, and to try, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I think that's probably the most inspiring thing for me um, about biomedical engineering as a whole is I really like I, I see it as something being like, okay, that's a problem. So how do we solve it? How do we face it? And there's I see so much innovation and determination and creativity in that space, right? Where when somebody used to think that that might be impossible, they're like, yeah, but what if it wasn't? And then they just go, yeah. right? Then they just act. I, I love that. Um, I'm very cognizant of your time right now. Can I have you for another few minutes? Is that cool? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, yeah. wonderful. I would love to get your opinion on something too. Going back to one of the other pieces that I read of yours, um, it was talking about uh, Olympic athletes, anabolic steroids, and uh, that I thought that was a very, very insightful piece and the sort of long-term, we'll call them benefits of steroids that, that could still be there even after you've ceased taking whatever it is you're taking. So in the realm of the Olympics right now, 
um, one of the things, uh, there was two questions I wanted to ask. The, the first one is, how do you think all of these new advancements in sports and even in those kinds of findings right there fall into or gear into that Olympic equation? Like, is, are, are these questions that we should be asking? And then the kind of second question to that is um, rehabilitation, regeneration, and enhancement. Like, are do we have to draw bright, bright screaming lines around these things, or is this something that we can kind of just let be? Anyways, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, a lot of what you've asked about was really central to the last book I wrote, you know, Chasing Captain America, mm -hmm. which was all about just talking about, you know. Becoming Batman was about training biology without altering biology. And my Inventing Iron Man book was about amplifying biology with technology. And then kind of the, the, the Captain America book was like, what if you just forget any of the rules we think we have around biology and just start changing everything? What can we actually mm -hmm. do? And, and why that's relevant, it's the things you're asking about are things I spent a lot of time thinking about when I was working on that book. Um, because... Uh, it really was a game changer in my own kind of viewpoint around, you know, what's doping, what isn't, what are real human limits, what, what is okay to do in one situation versus another, and why do I think that's different, and why do people say it's okay to take growth hormone if you're on a growth trajectory where you're not going to be as tall as somebody else, and then it's medically indicated, but if you want to be a basketball player who needs to be six foot ten, why can't you take it then? You mm -hmm. know, these kinds of things. What's different about that? Like, it's the same thing. It's going to do the same stuff. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that what's really critical here is that we need to think of everything as a continuum, right? I think there's mm -hmm. too much of, and, and again, it's, it comes back to being What's a simple way to describe something? It's this or it's that, or maybe there's three categories. It's this one, this one, this one, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but in reality, nothing biologically is on in categories. Everything's on a continuum. doesn't matter what the feature is that you're looking at, mm -hmm. uh, physiological product, strength, whatever, whatever you want to look at. There's no such thing as just pure. So when we try to look at doping versus not doping or, you know, this versus that, or all these kinds of things, the, or regeneration uh, enhancement, whatever it is, those are all the same things are just applied in different situations, you know, with somebody mm -hmm. with low function, and then we give them rehabilitation to improve their function. The ideas there are the same as when we take somebody who's already doing real well, and we want to make them uh, help them get to be an Olympic gold medalist. It's just a different place of performance, but the ideas are exactly the same. We're trying to drive a physiological set of changes. And, and I think that one of the things that is important for us to appreciate and understand about that is all the plasticity that goes into all those things and that gives rise to this tremendous stuff that we think of as you know the lives we experience when we start doing that though and if you're going to have a thing like the olympics i understand I, I would say that in life you know when it comes to amplifying biology or enhancing there aren't any like rules about stuff for a lot of as long as it's not illegal um, you know, doing whatever it is to enhance something, it's whatever is going to happen and whatever a person can, can do, they can do. Okay, in a sport competition, there are actual rules, obviously. You, can't, you can do this, you can't do this, you could do this, you could do that. And one of the concerns I have is that we know so much now that if that's what you're going to do, and I'm not even necessarily arguing that the Olympics, the way they're done, should really be done the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's too much stuff about you did this and you did that so you're out but you're in I, no I, I think it's yeah. just a lot of it gets a bit ridiculous but if you're going to have any kind of rule-based system you do need to look at it realistically and the truth is this when you start taking different anything even taking on knowledge in your brain you are changed and you don't get unchanged just by the passage of time mm -hmm. some of the things some of the prowess might be reduced like uh, if you did if you took anabolic steroids and you did a whole bunch of strength training to be whatever the sport would be and whatever the muscle groups would be, and you have this enhancement in performance, yeah, obviously you've got the training and the anabolic steroid. Then you stop, but the steroid has changed your body's ability to respond to training permanently through epigenetic mechanisms. So as you go forward now and you give somebody a band for three years and then they start training again, they're still carrying with them the advantage they got earlier. It's just like the passage of time doesn't 
somehow just make the, the changes in the ability of the body to respond to go away. So, so I think it, this is where you get all kind of muddled up because I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. if you're going to do this, then you can't do that. Like if, if you're saying this person is doping, then they're out. I'm sorry, you're done. You're not going to be competing in the Olympics anymore. Of course, depending on what the infractions, maybe the doping is like a uniform doping or whatever, and you're going to change that. Yeah. But if we're talking about a lot of the, especially the steroids and a variety of other stuff will come out over time, I'm sure about all the epigenetic mechanisms that might go with erythropoietin and all kinds of other things for blood doping and whatnot. You can't then say, okay, well, you can come back now because you sat in the corner for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, was the idea to make it a level playing field or was the idea to punish somebody? I don't know. I mean, it sounds like it's more the latter, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But if it's the former, then you got to be realistic about how you do this. Um, so I did have a way around this. I tried to suggest at one point, <laughs> um, and I did write a little small piece on my blog about this, even though it's kind of random. And that was, you know what? If you really want everything to be super fair in sport, which you can't do in life, but in sport, let's say we want to set it up to be that way. You could do this. You could have a, the, the ultimate Olympic challenge where everybody could compete fairly. You would have to take full on genomic screening of everybody, proteomic screen to know whether the proteins are there, metabolomic screen to know whether they're actually active. You would need to know what the relative expression of different performance uh, genes are, you know, that we know code for specific things. You would have to then set everybody up in terms of their relative, you know, uh, testosterone to uh, uh, estrogen ratios, all kinds of stuff to worry about gender and sex related stuff. And then you'd set everybody up based on weight categories, because a lot of the things that we think of as performance characteristics for sport, a lot of it is allometric scaling stuff for a person's bigger, so they've got more muscle mass, so they're stronger. And if, if this person tends to be bigger, then you see this. But if you actually get rid of that, they're a lot more similar. And you would do this kind of thing. And then you could have this amazing ultra fair competition where you throw everybody in and you'd say you five people are competing over here you other five you're doing the same competition over here you're against yourselves you're now it all comes down to just whoever trained hard which mm -hmm. is i think what people want but it's absurd because you'd have you know ten thousand categories uh for you know the bobsleigh <laughs> or ten thousand categories for the 500 meter whatever it would be some ridiculous thing that would be fair, but it would be absurd. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we need to figure out a way to arrive at a place where we're comfortable with mostly fair, mostly respects the ideas without going into sort of dogmatic uh, mm -hmm. reactions to everything, which I find, I don't know. I, I get it, I understand why it's like that, but it winds up being that kind of thing. If you tell everybody it's categories and then you start changing everything, well, of course, they're going to react the way they do, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was a bit rambly, uh, but, but that was my way of coming up with the actual only truly fair way I could imagine actually doing sport competition to break it all down so that you've got everybody relative proportions and fractions and genetic expression and active, uh, you know, enzymes for whatever pathway it is, same body weights. And then it's just about who tries harder. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be kind of ridiculous. But, yeah. <laughs> Still, I, this is, I, I get the idea that I could talk to you for hours and learn so many things about you. But again, very cognizant of your time. So I'm just going to ask you one more question. And that yeah. is, are there any particular initiatives or projects or endeavors you're working on right now that you're really excited about and you want us to get excited about too? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm trying, well, I'm still trying to work on ideas for books and things like that. You know, I'd like to write a sequel to my Batman book eventually um, to kind of bring back some ideas, but into the future and older and aging and kind of the whole neural degenerative part that I would like to throw in there. But it's, it's very much um, slower than it was uh, prior to when I had that last car crash. Um, and I just have to be more realistic about it. So I guess my biggest project is me at this point, I guess I would say. Um, but that I'm still trying to look for ways to contribute to society in a meaningful way and try to help people still, because that's still a thing I've come to realize not only has made me feel you know, connected to my society in a certain way, but it kind of really, um, even my activities now make me feel like I'm trying to contribute in, in a way and just trying to think about 
how to scale those differently. So um, hoping to still do some stuff, just working a little bit slower, uh, you know, than, than I was before. Well, Paul, it has been my genuine pleasure to speak with you. Um, and I cannot wait to see what those next things are, even if they come a little bit more slowly, doesn't matter. Uh, we need them and they're important. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks for your interest. I appreciate your time as well. Thanks.